Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I want to talk to you today about a very unusual person in esoteric history. His name is Jeffrey Hodson. And uh, I first encountered a book of his called The Kingdom of the Gods. It was sent to me in 1972 when I hosted the Mind's Ear radio program on KPFA FM in Berkeley, California. And it was a time when Hodson was still alive. He had been born in 1896. He died in 1983. He was very active in the Theosophical Society as well as uh, what is known as the liberal Catholic Church, which was closely aligned to the Theosophical Society. Now, this book, uh, The Kingdom of the Gods, I have saved it for nearly half a century because it is full of beautiful illustrations from his clairvoyant visions. He worked with an artist, and uh, he claimed to be able to see uh, many, many different types of spiritual entities, angels, fairies, mountain gods, ocean gods, regional gods. God's healing angels, and he describes them in great detail in terms of their appearance to him and in terms of their relationship to each other and their relationship to the uh, divine unity of all that is. Uh, it's very elegant, uh, and from all accounts, he was quite an elegant man himself. Uh, he lectured all over the world. He uh, engaged in clairvoyant investigations, working with scientists. And this is a tradition within the uh, theosophy that goes back to C.W. Ledbetter, who actually is one of the founders, as I understand it, of the liberal Catholic Church. And Ledbetter engaged in a series of clairvoyant investigations of the nature of the atom and actually uh, produced data suggesting in advance of scientific discoveries the uh, isotope of uh, hydrogen, deuterium. So, uh, people have been impressed. I recall when I interviewed physicist Russell Targ, he was very impressed by this early application of clairvoyance by uh, theosophists. And Hodson is in that tradition. In fact, he endeavored to do further work looking at the, into the nature of the atom. Apparently, uh, did a lot of extensive investigations, to my knowledge, have never been published and quite possibly never amounted to anything. Hodson believed he could see things in four dimensions, and uh, he acknowledged it's very hard to describe using normal language what things look like from that perspective. But he did talk about a, a hierarchy of beings from, uh, you know, the all encompassing oneness of the divine to uh, the division of the masculine and the feminine and then many different types, legions of principalities and thrones and angels and fairies all in a, in a kind of hierarchical relationship to each other. Now, I suspect that Hodson was a synesthete, a person who had a highly developed sense of synesthesia. Uh, I want you to know that uh, in eight days from the release of this monologue, I am releasing an interview with the uh, psychologist Christine Simmons Moore talking about the anomaly prone personality. I may link to it at some point once it's released and It'll be yeah, in the upper right hand uh, of your screen, the link, when I can do that. But uh, the point I want to make here is that uh, Christine talks quite a bit about synesthesia as a quality of people who report lots of spontaneous psychic experiences. And one of the main characteristics of synesthesia is, for example, people see music. And interestingly, Hodson actually wrote a book on this very topic called Music Forms. 
So he, he very definitely is the kind of person who saw music and he, he might look at a mountain and see a mountain god. Look at the ocean and, and see the God of the ocean. But it, it, more than that, he communicated with these beings. It wasn't just as some sort of a, a neurological oddity, a visual perception. He felt overwhelmed by their presence. He felt th that in the communion with these entities, he was becoming one with them, that that's how telepathy worked for him. Now, uh, in particular, he engaged in some clairvoyant investigations with an anthropologist, John Talbot Robinson. And Robinson actually had achieved something of a name for himself because he was one of the discoverers in South Africa of uh, Australopithecus africanus, one of the early pre Homo sapien hominids, one of our ancestors, in fact, <laughs> showing the, the skull. And he engaged in a series of clairvoyant experiments with Hodson. Both uh, Robinson and his mentor, Broom was uh, the name, I think it was Harold Broom, uh, who made these discoveries, uh, were both very open to the esoteric, to the mystical and the occult. And Hodson was traveling in South Africa. I think he lived in South Africa for a while. He lived in New Zealand for a while. He was British. And Robinson had all, a collection of these specimens, hominids, our, our pre-Homo sapien ancestors, some of them two million years old. And he conducted a series of studies with Hodson, in which he, uh, Hodson would be in a trance, lying down on his back with his eyes closed, and Robinson would take a piece of bone or something and place it on his forehead. So he didn't see it. He didn't know what it was. And according to Robinson, all of the information that Hodson provided about these specimens, to the extent that it was traceable and knowable, all of it proved to be accurate. 100%. That's what he claimed. Uh, although he acknowledged that many facts or pieces of ostensible information provided by Hodson couldn't be verified one way or the other. But to the extent it could be verified, he even went so far to say that sometimes he would take the same bone or fragment and place it on uh, Hodson's forehead more than once. Hodson didn't know. His eyes were closed. He said he never gave conflicting information about the same piece of evidence. So, uh, from Robinson's reports, you'd have to say that Hodson's clairvoyance was highly accurate. And uh, interestingly, he was working with parapsychologists at a time when uh, quantum mechanical random event generators were being used. Hodson uh, was asked if he could produce the next number the generator would uh, provide, and he refused. He said, I don't have any interest in that. I, I can only do this if there's a a motive. And when you ask me to just guess random numbers, I have no motive, so I'll decline, uh, is what he said. Uh, that seems sensible. He seemed, from all accounts, to be uh, sincere, honest, and, and trustworthy. He wasn't trying to fool anybody. However, it does seem that he himself got fooled on one very famous occasion. He was a young man at the time. We're talking about uh, the 1920s and an incident known as the Cottingley Fairies, which achieved uh, worldwide fame because the famous author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes Mysteries, who was also a spiritualist, took an interest in this case and arranged for photographs of the fairies, and I'm showing them to you now, to be published in Strand, the same magazine that was publishing the Sherlock Holmes stories at the time. So, the, the, the publication of these images caused a worldwide sensation. There were two young children, two girls, Elsie Wright and Frances Griffiths, who produced these photographs. Um, at the time they were published in Strand, I think they were touched up quite a bit. And 
Conan Doyle thought they were real, and on the advice of some friends who were theosophists, they brought in Hodson, who even as a young man had a reputation as a clairvoyant. His abilities, apparently his synesthesia, was with him since childhood. He saw spirits everywhere. Which I just want to mention is, is an interesting, um, story to talk about since uh, just yesterday I uh, or the day before this monologue is being released. I've released the interview with um, Randy Kritkowski about uh, 21st century animism. Well, Kahadzen was clearly an animist. All of these images of spirits that he sees all over the place, little ones, big ones, a hierarchy of spirits. So he was brought in by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He met these young girls. He spent, I think, two weeks with them. He described seeing the fairies himself. And the girls uh, said, well, they were with him. They didn't see the same ones when he was there, but his descriptions of fairies matched theirs. And he said that he was convinced based on his two weeks of time with these young girls that they were being sincere, that they weren't faking the photographs. Now, it turns out that uh, today it's well accepted that these photographs were fake and how they were fake cardboard cutouts of fairies from another book, which was identified. And, um, later on these, uh, Young girls, well, they lived to the 1980s, confessed that this is how it was done. And even if you go to the JeffreyHodson.com website being maintained by one of Hodson's devotees, one of his disciples, he even acknowledges that these fairy photographs were fake and Hodson was deceived by these young girls, but he raises this question. Did he actually see fairies using his clairvoyant vision? Because he said he saw them all the time. And even though the young girls faked the photographs, they claimed that they had also seen fairies. Could it be that they were synesthetes? Synesthetes are people who are going to get impressions perhaps at the clairvoyant level and they will display visually in the sensorium of the mind. Well, it's a fascinating story about a man, uh, a, a great speaker, a great writer, uh, clearly a sincere theosophist, Although there is um, a fellow named Carlos Cardoso Aveline criticizes Hodson, saying he was really uh, caught up in fakery. And you can tell because of his many supposed conversations with the hidden masters of theosophy, they're always praising him. And according to Aveline, no true master would want to keep stroking the ego of a disciple like like that. So, you know, even within theosophy, there are controversies about these things. But it strikes me that Hansen was truly a sincere man and truly a man of gifts. But the interesting thing is, he was apparently easily fooled, as was Conan Doyle. Uh, the writer of Sherlock Holmes, somebody who could solve almost every mystery. We're both taken in by uh, the apparent sincerity of these uh, young girls who produce the Cottingley fairy photographs. Let me leave you with this thought. Are there times in your life when, for the best of motives, you have ever been deceived? I'll leave you with that thought and thank you once again for being with me.